you very much and uh, congratulations Zev on your birthday. Uh, celebrating, uh, this was supposed to be a conference, I guess. Uh, maybe we'll do it at 61. That's what happened with me. Uh, more, I had a secret 60th birthday in, in, in Israel, but then a, another one in, in, in Princeton. Um, but for me, the real reason is I didn't want to admit I'm 60. Apparently Zev's not shy, so that's very good. Well, so, I feel like I'm 16. Uh, excellent. Uh, I hope that stays <laughs> for, for many years. Okay, so I, I'm going to uh, spend half the lecture on uh, maybe reviewing uh, very in very brief terms only some of Zev's work and then move towards some topic that uh, is related to what I'm talking. So I'm only going to discuss the work of his that's relevant to what I want to turn to. Uh, feel free to interrupt, as Lior said, I think it's very important. Otherwise, uh, I actually don't even know if I've been cut off and just talking to myself here in my bedroom. Okay, so um, let me start. So I'm going to talk about, I'll describe various summation formula and then how they might, how they have been used and uh, especially how Zev has used them. And then I'll return to it in a discussion of a specific example. So perhaps the most important summation formula that uh, every number theorist knows or anybody who's seen the zeta function knows or anything or modular forms is the Poisson summation formula. I have a cursor here, which I'll use, which is the only tool I'll have to communicate with you other than my voice. So you take a Schwartz function in Rn, you define the Fourier transform with the right uh, e to the two pi i, this e is e to the two pi i, that way the, sum, the formula reads uh, a little better. And the sum over a lattice of the values of the function at the lattice is say the volume of the lattice is one as, as uh, co-volume as Zn is, and Zn is self-dual, is the sum of the Fourier transform at the integer points. This is a statement about the integers, the discrete group Zn in, in the way that it sits in Rn. And it's a fundamental fact and one puts in different test functions uh, and learns a lot in various uh, mainly analytic type of problems connected with uh, the structure, additive structure of the integers. And another, another way of stating this Poisson summation formula is if we take the measure which puts delta masses at the point, uh, at the lattice points in Zn, and uh, that would be a tempered mass, it's a point mass, then its Fourier transform equals itself. And I'll return to this because uh, this talk is about summation formula, something called crystalline measures, which uh, are of great interest uh, in um, quasi crystals and things like that, but certainly related to number theory. So this is the Poisson summation formula and it's my formula number one in the uh, type of formula that I want to discuss. The second formula, I'll just state the very simplest version of the Selberg trace formula. As you all know, the Selberg trace formula has proved to be one of the most important tools in the theory of automorphic forms in its use in certain ways. But as I described Zev's work, the use of these formulae that he has made, at least in print, uh, are much closer to the way Selberg envisioned or used it and envisioned the way it would be used. So here's the Selberg trace formula. We have a discrete subgroup of SL2R. I'll assume it to be in a very simple situation, I'll even remove SL2Z into, out of the discussion. So it's discrete, torsion-free and co-compact so that the only uh, elements in the group which are not um, the trivial element are high, what are called hyperbolic elements. So they're diagonalizable over R. And we form the quotient, the upper half plane divided by gamma. That's a hyperbolic surface. It's also a complex curve of dimension one, but it's also uh, got a hyperbolic geometry. And that's the part that the Selberg, simplest form of the Selberg trace formula involves. We take the Laplacian for this metric on this compact quotient. We write the eigenvalues as a quarter plus Tj squared. So the smallest eigenvalue is zero corresponding to the constant function and the co correct parameter for the, form, for the summation formula are these numbers tj. So lambda zero would mean that t zero is i over two and you must watch for that because we can evaluate a function in the complex domain unlike this Poisson summation where everything is real. 
I'm following Selberg's notation here. So he def we define the we make this definition of the Fourier transform here with a two pi and not with the e to the two pi i. So let's just stick to that. And then the Selberg trace formula in its simplest case reads that the sum of a test function at the numbers tj, tj remember with those relatives of the eigenvalues, is the area of this surface times uh, a, a, a mass, which is very important, it's a Plancherel measure, t hyperbolic tangent pi t times h of t dt. So this is a continuous part. And then there's a discrete part, which looks very much like the Poisson sum, or what I will call crystalline measures later. So the sum of point masses, h at point masses, is the sum of the Fourier transform at a discrete set of points. And this time, it's the lengths of the closed geodesics on the Riemann surface with a weight which is the primitive length of a closed geodesic divided by e to the L over two, so a hyperbolic sign over here, sorry. And P goes over all the, so this is a discrete set and I'll uh, be discussing how one, uh, how Zev uses these things. The third is what I will call the riemann guinand ve explicit formula. So if you take the Riemann zeta function, summation n to minus s, you write the non-trivial zeros as a half plus i gamma j. So the gamma j's are supposed to be like the tj's and like in the Poisson summation formula. So if the Riemann hypothesis is true, then the gammas are all real. And you sum this test function, by the way, in the Selberg formula, g is compact support. You can relax that condition, but it's not symmetric. It's absolutely not symmetric because h is evaluated at a complex number. So g is compact support and the Fourier transforms entire. Similarly, here in this Guinan formula, uh, we're evaluating H. So I'm using exactly the same notation as in the Selberg trace formula. I'm evaluating H at the point I over two. So G is compact support. So the sum of this test function at these real numbers, if the Riemann hypothesis is true, we can get rid of this if we put a character. So this is coming from the pole of the zeta function. Then there's the analog of the Plancherel measure, which is this uh, gamma primed over gamma h of r gamma primed over gamma, and minus, not plus, two times the sum over prime powers, which looks very similar to that, very suggestive. Lambda of n is a von Mangold function, log p if n is a prime power, and g evaluated log n's. Again, it's a sum of del uh, point masses, discrete set, but there's a fundamental difference here to the Poisson sum, these two here. And I want to explain that in a second. Okay, these are the three formula that I will, uh, they have generalizations and variations, certainly the Selberg trace formula most uh, notably, but uh, I will just uh, highlight things with these three. Notice that if the Riemann hypothesis is true and I sum over these delta masses of the non-trivial zeros, then this is a tempered distribution. Uh, and if a distribution is tempered, it's a sum of delta masses, tempered distribution, it's Fourier transform is also tempered. But unlike in Poisson summation, the absolute value here is never tempered because this hi over two minus this, there's a, can a big cancellation here, which is making the right-hand side tempered. And if you put a character, this wouldn't be a positive sum over here. So uh, it's tempered if the Riemann hypothesis is true, but not absolutely tempered. And this is uh, an important point as we go along. All right. So for Riemann, the explicit formula number C, he never wrote it that way. He wrote it in a somewhat different way. It was his great paper where he gave you an exact formula counting the number of primes less than X in terms of the zeros. And this is just an integrated smooth version of that. For Guinand, I'll return to that a little bit. So this is before Andre Vey. For Guinand, this formula was about concordant sequence or what Meir today calls quasi-crystalline -crystal, um, measures. And I'll return to that. And for Andre Vey, this was late in his life. It was an attempt to try maybe get a handle on the Riemann hypothesis. And he wanted to interpret the explicit formula that I've just written down in the way that it's interpreted, that he interpreted, or Schmidt before him many years before, uh, for curves of a finite fields uh, in terms of the eigenvalues of Frobenius, so as to suggest uh, how one might attack the Riemann hypothesis. Now, I know Zev quite well, but in his work, he's led the way in applications, as I said, not in the way that Arthur and Langlands use it in terms of comparison of trace formulas, but rather in terms of using the formula one at a time, the way Selberg actually 
himself used it for various purposes. Uh, he and I, and I'll get to that in a second, wrote a paper about the explicit formula. I don't know the extent to which uh, he here, he here means Zev has thought about the use of C in the connection with the Riemann hypothesis. If he's thought about it, he's kept his thoughts to himself. Uh, I don't know uh, if he's had those thoughts, but that maybe he can address after my lecture here. But certainly others have looked at this explicit formula and I could give uh, maybe two or three hour lecture on that, but that I won't do over here. I want to describe actual theorems. Uh, so Weiss uh, uh, got his name onto this in trying to, uh, as I say, definitely uh, interpret the zeros uh, in some other way. All right, so uh, at this point, I'm turning now to a few of Zerb's works and I'm not going to discuss uh, by any means all of his works. I think we should leave that for his 61st birthday, which hopefully will take place in a physical location somewhere. So he can follow in the tradition of 60 and 61 birthdays. And at that point, uh, somebody will be assigned to actually explain his works in, in some serious way. This is just as a, a makeup call for his birthday two weeks ago. Um, so his thesis, Zev's thesis, which is not so well known, but which I took quick notice of, written under Piotrowski Shapiro, uh, concerns the Selberg formula that I wrote down there and something called the Peterson formula. He did this for SL2Z. And the Peterson formula is a summation formula. It's not a trace formula, but it's very much uh, related to what today is called the relative trace formula, because it's uh, the peterson kuznetsa formula. And what Zev's thesis is about is relating these two and deriving one from the other and making some other applications. It's a, an important philosophical point to understand when you use the Peterson formula or the Kuznetsov formula to your advantage versus the Selberg trace formula. And sometimes you introduce the one from the other as Henrik Divanich, who I saw a little earlier come on, uh, it, it brilliantly has exploited. Anyway, um, uh, his thesis actually is being referred to more recently, so it's, I don't think, I don't know if it was published, but people have referred to it more recently, especially in connection with beyond endoscopy. And you can see a letter I wrote to Langlands about beyond endoscopy where the, this issue that the Ev was the first to look at is, is central. Okay, the second application that Zev gave, and this uh, actually happens to be joined with me, is the computation of the n-level correlations of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, uh, a project that we started with some other completely different set of ideas. So let's suppose that the uh, zeros are half plus gamma j. Assume Riemann just for the interpretation here. And uh, in order, so these are real numbers. They're the ordinates of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. And you want to make the mean spacing one. So you inflate them locally a little bit like I have there, because you know how many zeros there are up to high t. So you make these numbers gamma j hat so that they normalize to have mean spacing one. And then you look at the spacings, local spacing statistics between them. And in a great and very influential, as it turns out, uh, paper many, many years ago, Montgomery computed the pair correlation in restricted ranges for the zeta function. And what Zev and I wanted to do was we were sure, at least I think we were, that uh, the zeros of an automorphic L function would absolutely not follow GU, and all this was just a red herring and a nonsense. And the reason we felt that was that the distribution of the coefficients, in, so in, when you write down the explicit formula more generally, like here with a more general automorphic form, these coefficients here are replaced by the local coefficients of the L function of the automorphic form on GLN, say. And then those don't obey, those have very different distributions and they can be very complicated, generalizations of the cytopate distribution. So, we were expecting that the zeros would also then have very different distributions, but we quickly saw that the pair correlation would not change. And so we felt we had to compute all correlations. And we did that for all L functions. And to our amazement, there was only one answer, GUE. It was absolutely always universal as predicted by Dyson. So this was uh, a nice, and we actually formulated the, uh, we actually, I think the first to formulate properly what these things mean in the mathematical world. Uh, and we computed these in restricted ranges. I want to point out that there was something that entered there, which held us up for quite a while. 
and it was a combinatorial identity in order to show the answer was GUE that we struggled with. We had to prove a combinatorial identity, which we managed to do. And then in, in the generalizations, this then became quite a, uh, a big industry in these generalizations. Um, these combinatorial identities were, were not so easy to prove. But in a beautiful paper, Alex Enten, Roditi, Gershon, and Zev in 2013, they, uh, at that point, Zev is heavily working in the function field, which I'll return to in a moment, uh, made the same computations that you do in the number field, and then made the great insight that in the function field, there are other ways of proving the uh, statistics, local statistics that you want on average anyway. And as a consequence, the identity that you need to prove at the end is coming for free. In other words, you've translated and proved in the number field an identity by proving it in the function field only because it's an identity. So it's not like you're transferring the proof of the Riemann hypothesis from a function field to a number field that we don't know how to do. But if there's an identity that you're trying to transfer, that may be doable. And that's very much how the fundamental lemma was solved because Hale's first to observe this and Valtzberger and Nagao, of course, proved the fundamental lemma in the function field, but it's an identity just like here and works in the number field. So it's very much like that and gave a complete understanding of how you uh, understand the identity which connects everything up at the end. So that was uh, uh, for me and for Zev, I think a, uh, an application of the explicit formula, not by interpreting anything, but by actually using it because it's got two sides and by doing uh, analysis in the way that uh, one does with such an identity. All right, following uh, that paper of uh, from, uh, I think, 1994, there, Zev has made many, many contributions to the study of spectral statistics. He got very interested in the local distribution of zeros and eigenvalues in many different kinds of um, uh, mechanical systems that you quantize. So with, with, on the zeros, he wrote papers uh, with Keating and Hughes, but for eigenvalues, he really got interested in the torus. And I've always teased him why are you only working on the torus, but the torus is a, a beautiful place to test all sorts of theories. Uh, and it's highly non-trivial. And his works with Bergen become, uh, obviously uh, at some point become tricky harmonic analysis and they have made very delicate and deep in, uh, results uh, in uh, the works on uh, not just the spectrum, but the uh, nodal domains with Wigman and Kohlberg uh, are also very uh, deep results on uh, the case of a torus. But the torus is special and I think Zev has completely led this uh, study. Also for hyperbolic Laplacians and hyperbolic surfaces, as Zev has made many, many contributions uh, with, and he's made, uh, um, I don't, I'm just not gonna spend time going through explaining. I'm just going to explain one example here and it's a typical uh, Rudnick theorem. So uh, let's take the torus where he's done a lot of very interesting works and let's uh, perturb it. So we take the torus and the Laplacian on the torus, you can write the eigenfunctions down explicitly and the eigenvalues are quadratic form with maybe irrational coefficients. So you know what the eigenvalues are. That doesn't mean that you can answer these local statistic questions, by the way, and that's exactly where Zev gets interested. You can write them down, but then it becomes a tricky number theory problem to answer these basic questions. In any event, suppose we take a rank one perturbation. So we, these are called Sieber billiards or uh, in Zev's paper with Uber Shar, they are called point scatterers. You add, a rank one perturbation, you have to make uh, precise what you mean by the self adjoint extension with this delta mass. Uh, so it shouldn't change your eigenvalues too much. They actually have to interlace, but the spacings between them are completely unclear. So the theorem they prove by writing down an explicit version of this trace formula and make appropriate analysis uh, and estimates is that if you want to look at the consecutive spacing, by the way, this is in dimension two, otherwise this analysis is not, uh, not true. Uh, in dimension two, the eigenvalues, the energy levels themselves uh, come down roughly, uh, you don't have to rescale them if you look at the eigenvalues. So I'll just normalize them so that the J eigenvalues are some, excuse me, asymptotic to J. And I'll look at the consecutive spacing for the Laplacian, 
which I'll say a word about in a second. And I look at the consecutive spacing for this perturbed, this rank one perturbation, they prove those two distributions are the same. They don't know it exists even for a flat torus, say with alpha equal to root two, that's one of his favorite problems. But if the spacing distribution for a flat torus with alpha equal root two is Poissonian as uh, he and I expect, then so would the uh, perturbed guy be Poissonian. And this is uh, to me very beautiful and a typical clean, uh, Zerber likes writing uh, clean, decisive and short papers with a keen idea and a very beautiful argument. That's one example. Uh, I think it was uh, in the 90s and then certainly in the 2000s that Zev turned to the function field in a big way. The function field is another place where you can test all these ideas, but there's arithmetic and the algebra and number theory uh, that's uh, separately interesting. So uh, the replacement here is you replace the rational numbers by FQT, the rational function field, FQ is a finite field. The integers are replaced by the polynomials uh, in T. Uh, of course, if you're a serious guy here, you don't just look at this uh, function field, you look at a finite extension because the zeta function of this particular guy is but no zeros. It's, uh, very, it's, one, it's uh, completely boring. But if you look at a finite extension, that's uh, the zeta functions of those are exactly the curves of a finite fields. Uh, however, when you look, you can still look at FQT and much of what he does, I'm sure would, uh, what I like very much about Zev's work is he goes to the real action and doesn't worry about generalizing too much or take a curve or of a, of a field or arbitrary curve. Uh, the, the, the beef is here, as I like to say. And he's going to look at these questions of uh, zeros associated with certain problems of L functions and their local spacing statistics. And then also, once you're looking at that explicit formula, there are two sides to the formula. The one side is you want to understand these zeros or the eigenvalues. In this case, they are actually eigenvalues. And on the other side, you want to understand the arithmetic of primes, progressions, and problems like that. So, uh, in all, in both of these, he's made, uh, and others have well as well, but uh, I think in many works with Rudnick, uh, with Rudnick, with Keating, <laughs> excuse me, uh, they have uh, made decisive results, at least when Q goes to infinity. That's uh, the one thing they have to do, because in the end, there are equidistribution theorems uh, for families and exponential sums uh, that come from higher dimensional uh, use of the Lean's work that uh, are often the decisive or the thing that does the heavy lifting. Uh, so, for example, they study the distribution of primes in short intervals in this function field and in short progressions and obtain uh, re sharp results that, at least in the Q going to infinity, uh, are certainly not known over the number field. I want to point out that uh, uh, Sarah gave a lecture here maybe 10 years ago, and he looked over at Henrik who <laughs> and said, uh, the, uh, any, uh, problems of a certain type like the Charlo conjecture, the Hardy Littlewood K double conjecture are unmotivated. And I thought, wow, that's kind of a, that's not a nice I still cannot thing. recover from his comment. This was about my work with Duke. Yeah, I know, I know. He said it was unmotivated, but what he really, he had a, it was a deep joke. It took me a while to understand. What he meant is it's not a natural question coming from a motivic setup of the use of L functions. So the motivic setting of using L functions means Shabotarev. The only thing you want to use is Shabotarev and variations on Shabotarev. When you start talking about twin primes, it's not motivic, but he made the joke of unmotivated. Uh, and so Zev has looked at these unmotivated problems with great success. And in particular, I like very much his, uh, this would be a typical example, his work with Dan Cameron uh, about the Charlo conjecture in the function field. So he's looking at these polynomials, monic polynomials of degree n uh, in the polynomial ring FQX. And you look at the correlation. So you take alpha one to alpha r, mu is the Mobius function that's defined in the same way in the function field. And uh, alpha one to alpha r are fixed. So this is r correlations and you sum the Mobius shifted by alpha one up to alpha r 
over these monic polynomials of degree. And in the number field, you have to sum up to some point because there aren't many uh, numbers of, of a given size, but in the function field, there are these big shells. So you sum over these shells. So you sum over MN, one over the number, and that should go to zero if the Charler conjecture is true uh, in the function field. And you shouldn't have to uh, make this Q go to infinity, but that is the part that uh, these works uh, where one has uh, very complete results, Zev kind of leading that or involved in many of that. Uh, this is a typical example. As Q goes to infinity, you prove the correlations. Uh, the alphas are distinct, of course. Uh, you prove the correlations uh, go to zero and you prove the analog of the Charlotte conjecture. I should say that uh, the starting point is a great exploitation of the fact that in the function field in this setting, there's a very simple formula for the Mobius function in terms of a character and the, discri and the discriminant and the degree of, it, of f. There's nothing like this in the number field. So the number field, uh, we don't expect any structure of this type. Unless there's a Ziegel zero, Landau Ziegel zero, then in fact, there is a character, Mobius, do, uh, there is a character, uh, if you have a sequence of very bad zeros, then you would have the corresponding character mimicking Mobius. And in fact, you can then use it in this kind of way as he's branded many years ago to prove the twin prime conjecture if there's a sequence of Ziegel zero. But of course, there isn't such a thing. While in the function field, is, it's quite different. And it's the starting point that they exploit and that many people have exploited after them and before them, I should mention, Conrad, Conrad and uh, Gross also use this kind of thing. To end this uh, little review of the function field, uh, there are some uh, quite dramatic theorems in the last few years where Q is fixed and you're still able to prove that. And of course, that's really what, uh, that's very impressive. And uh, these kind of things start with the work of Ellenberg, Venkatesh, and uh, Westerland, who proved the cohen lenstra heuristic, essentially, for a fixed large Q. And the big difference here is when you let Q go to infinity, you have a main term, which is like Q to the n. And then the next term would be Q to the n minus 1. And uh, if you let Q go to infinity, then you've got your main term. But if you fix Q, then the Q to the n minus 1 would look very bad. So you need to know that in your exponential sums or whatever you're getting your hands through uh, in this kind of exploitation, and there are exploitations of this uh, in this work of uh, Sowen and Schusterman, uh, variants of that, that they uh, highlight and use. Uh, one needs uh, to have a, a vanishing range of cohomology. And this was a big insight of this paper here. And a similar thing is used in part here. And we heard a lecture by Sawan, a beautiful lecture just a few weeks ago of a proof of Charla, uh, not for Q a prime, but for Q a prime power, as long as A is uh, a little bit big. Uh, they proved this co uh, conjecture over here, but not forcing Q to go to infinity, but just letting N go to infinity, which is quite beautiful. So uh, I said I would spend half uh, the lecture on reviewing a very small set of Zev's works, but they are all using uh, the connection between, uh, um, of course, there's a tremendous thing, other, a lot of things that go into it, but the uh, explicit formula is used heavily in many of his, as a starting point in many of his, of his uh, works. I want to talk, turn now for the next half of my lecture to an example, which is very much along the line of what Zev does and it's joint work with uh, Pavel Kurasov, and it will return to the explicit formula, which is why I started there. And this is an example um, which in many ways uh, is much richer than I had imagined before I started working with him. And it uh, is one where we can say something quite interesting and even solve some interesting problems related to explicit formula. So the setting is as follows. We, uh, we want to start off with a Poisson summation formula. Now the Poisson summation formula corresponds to uh, a torus, but let's start in dimension one. In dimension one, there's only one compact Riemannian manifold, and that is a circle and it's parameterized by its length. And if I write down the Selberg trace formula for that setting, the eigenvalues are m squared. And if I take the square root of the eigenvalues and write down the trace formula, that is the Poisson summation formula. It's so one case where the Selberg formula and the Poisson are identical. Uh, 
And the Poisson summation formula is just that the Fourier transform of a point masses at, on an arithmetic progression is the sum of point masses on an arithmetic progression. So I want to uh, look at one dimensional manifolds. You see the Riemann zeta function has T log T zeros. It's like a one, it's a singular one dimensional manifold. So let's uh, actually have something real one dimensional manifold which uh, we can analyze, but we have to make it singular. So we make it take a graph. So here's a graph, take any finite graph and we put lengths on the edges. So it's got, let's say it's got capital N edges and capital M vertices. And let's put lengths L1 up to Ln on the edges. And I now think of the lengths as vibrating rods or springs. And I join them, the singularity of this one dimensional manifold is where I, at the vertices, which uh, if there's only degree two vertices, then it's not really singular. So we will assume there are no degree two vertices in the graph. And what is the eigenvalue problem we want to study? We look at the Laplacian on, the edge, on this graph. So firstly, in, on the interior of the edge, it's just d2 by dx squared. It's a vibrating uh, string. And on the boundary conditions, and this is important, we have to decide how we're going to resolve these singularities to make the operator self adjoint. And so this is what people, some people call these quantum graphs. I'll just call them a metric graph. It's just a singular one dimensional manifold. And the boundary condition I'm gonna choose here, you can choose a little different boundary conditions, but uh, in terms of the number theory that I'll be using later, uh, not, not the most general boundary condition. But let's start with the simplest. It's Neumann or Kir Kirchhoff boundary condition. So the function at the vertex must be continuous. And I want the uh, directional derivatives of the function, the sum over all incoming uh, edges into a vertex to sum to zero for each vertex V. Uh, you can check that this uh, gives a self-adjoint operator and it has a spectrum. So uh, this uh, Laplacian on this graph is uh, on this metric graph, this is one dimensional, is self-adjoint, has a discrete spectrum K. And uh, we write, I, I'm one of the few people who still uh, does this. This is where you can tell that I'm 67, well, so there's only 60. I write uh, the eigenvalue as Laplacian phi plus lambda phi equals zero, because I want lambda to be non-negative. I don't put minus Laplace in. And this uh, Selberg did, and I, I follow his tradition. So the eigenvalues are non-negative, and we write them as k squared, which is uh, very natural from all points of view. All right, so I want to look at the spectrum k of, of, of this metric graph. So it is convenient, and this is extremely important for this, to not define the spectrum to just be plus minus k, so I'll make everything even, but to adjust it at the point zero, so the multiplicity of the eigenvalue zero, the graphs seem to be connected, is always going to be one. But I'm going to actually change that definition at the origin because of a formula I want to hold later on. So the multiplicity of the eigenvalue zero will be two plus n minus m. n is the number of uh, edges and m is the number of vertices. So that's basically one plus the Euler characteristic. <clears throat> and that is the multiplicity I will insist at the origin and it will make certain identities true. So for example, if the graph has loops, there's a figure eight graph uh, with lengths L1 and L2 as shown there, then the spectrum can be computed. You'll see in a minute, in a second, this is the only guy which is uh, different to everything else. It'll be a, a union of three arithmetic progressions, two pi k1 over L1, two pi k2 over L2, and two pi k3 over L1 plus L2. And if I didn't uh, introduce this multiplicity at zero to be three, which I've done here, so the spectrum is gonna be the union of these progressions where if a number's hit uh, more than once, by definition, it's counted more, uh, the number of times it's hit. So this is the spectrum uh, if, they, if it's in, and that is, I haven't shown you how to compute this, you'll see in a second, but that's uh, why we make this definition at the origin. All right, so there's a one dimensional manifold. So uh, the length uh, is a, a positive integer or can- No, no, a real number, a positive real number, thank you. And I will be choosing them carefully later. Uh, that's important, uh, there's, there's these parameters L1 to Ln, it's a, uh, they got lengths and the lengths, uh, if they're all equal, then 
it's very easy to compute everything. They're going to be chosen to be linearly independent over the rationals in a minute. Okay, so, but given any uh, metric graph like this, we have a vial law. So uh, uh, Zev uh, has worked a lot on vial laws for, in hyperbolic surfaces and things like that, but this is one dimensional, it should be easy. Uh, and it is the number of points in the spectrum in an interval minus TT is like one dimensional. So it'll be a constant times T. And that constant is the volume of this, uh, or the, with the length in this case, which is the sum of the lengths times two over pi, just like you uh, would see in any vial law. And it's very easy to see that the remainder here is very small. It's at most one. So it looks, smells, and uh, in, in that in the above case is an arithmetic progression. So it looks like we are looking at something which is just gen a generalization of arithmetic progression. At any crude scale, it is an arithmetic progression. Uh, but that's the question we want to study here. What is the nature of the spectrum of a metric graph? And if it were this figure eight, it would be very simple. It's just the union of three arithmetic progressions. All right, so how do you compute the spectrum? And this leads us to some very interesting Diophantine geometry. So on the edges, the eigenfunctions must be, uh, if the eigenvalue is k, it must be a sum of exponential because that's the only solution that it could be in the, in the variable xj. And then uh, you go to the vertices and see how we've uh, made the self adjoint problem and we find a secular determinant. This was first maybe done by Kotos and Smilansky. And it's given as follows. So I want to explain the computation of the spectrum by some several variable polynomials and some algebraic geometry. So we make a n is the number of edges. So you take two n by two n matrices indexed by the oriented edges. E1 is an edge and E1 bars going the opposite direction. And you make a matrix, which is a diagonal matrix, u uh, as a function of uh, n complex variables will be u f g. So f and g are directed edges will be z f times delta f g. So if f equals g, It'll be ZF and otherwise it's zero. So this is a diagonal matrix with entry Z1 up to ZN. So it's got N complex variables. And S, this what is called the scattering matrix and it's a good name for it. Uh, it's got entry S little s FG where little s FG if the edge, if F is, remember F is directed edge. If uh, G follows F, that's this minus delta FG hat then it's minus one plus one over two divided by the degree. Uh, the degree will never be two because then there's no singularity, then you just remove it. So this is some number here. If F equals G hat, then it, you put a minus one there and otherwise you just two over the degree and zero otherwise. If this is if G follows F and zero otherwise. And you can check S is a unitary matrix. This is extremely important. And the uh, secular polynomial or the spectral polynomial uh, is the following polynomial in n complex variables. Pg of z1 to zn is the determinant of i minus this diagonal u times this unitary matrix S. So let me say a few words about the properties of this polynomial. It's a degree 2n total and it's a degree 2 in each variable zj. And if you uh, invert the variables, so if you take p iota of z1 to zn, which is p of 1 over z1 up to 1 over zn, so you invert in the, in each separately at the same time, this involution, then the polynomial of n variables, this Laurent polynomial, is best thought of a Laurent polynomial because uh, we're not interested when any of the z's are zero. So but the way I define it, it is a polynomial. The, the polynomial P of G and the, poly, the iota polynomial are both what are called stable. They do not vanish if any of the Z's uh, are inside the unit, in, strictly inside the unit disk. And this follows easily from the unit, unitarity. So uh, this is the notion of a stable polynomial. And I mention that because that's one of the key ingredients that will be used in something that's coming. All right. Now, why is this polynomial interesting in terms of this metric graph is if I want to compute the spectrum of X, and this was uh, written down very clearly by, by Barra and Gaspard, who actually did uh, a, a problem that uh, they answered uh, the question of what's the consecutive spacing distribution of the eigenvalues of such a metric graph. And they found that 
you can write it down it's not universal and you can write it down in terms of some return map on on uh, relative to this uh, torus action this uh, line in a torus i won't go into that here but they uh, write down uh, this uh, very cleanly that the spectrum and this is why we define the spectrum at the origin to be that multiplicity so the spectrum is the zeros of uh, with multiplicity counter with multiplicity of the map, the entire function k, k is a complex variable, goes to pg evaluated at e to the i k l1, e to the i k l2 up to e to the i k l n. So the l's are fixed, those are the positive lengths. And you look at this function of k, which is uh, an entire function in the variable k, it only has real zeros. And if you look at the zeros and multiplicities, this computes a spectrum of x. And if you take the figure eight and compute this, you will see you get three, uh, the zero set is going to be uh, three hyperplanes, three lines, and you get those three arithmetic progressions. So from this point of view, the algebraic variety, the zero set of the spectral polynomial in several variables in the torus, C star to the N is clearly decisive for uh, understanding the spectrum. And that's our starting point. And now I'd like to explain the theorems that we can prove. This is Kurasov and myself, and this uses heavy diophantine geometry, which I'll end by just saying what the heavy lifting is. So these are the theorems. Uh, we have a whole study of the spectrum of metric graphs, the additive or arithmetic structure of the spectrum, something that I've never seen able, one able to do in any other situation other than trivial ones. And that is, so the first thing before we apply the diophantine geometry is we needed to understand the zero set. So I'll assume here that G has no loops. That's the simplest case and the case of most interest anyway. So the graph G, G is the graph and the metric graph I'll call gamma. <clears throat> that X was the metric graph, it depends on the lengths. The G is just the combinatorial graph. So assume the graph has got no loops then the zero set is absolutely irreducible over the complex numbers. And most importantly, the zero set contains no translates of any n minus one dimensional sub torus. This is critical. So the first part here, A was conjectured by Colin de Verdier, and we have a proof of that. And that's important in how we proceed further. And then the main theorem is a complete additive, uh, not complete, but uh, I would say, quite complete understanding of the additive structure of the spectrum. So if G contains no loops again, and if the lengths are linearly independent over the rationals, sorry, the quantifiers are as follows. G is given, there's a constant CG, which we can compute effectively. I'll explain what's not effective as we go along, but constant we can compute effectively. It's very large and way bigger than it should be, such that if you take any linearly independent lengths, and any arithmetic progression, then the spectrum of X intersect the progression is got at most C of G points. So there are no arithmetic progressions of length C of G inside the spectrum. It's very far from Poisson sum, nothing like it. And the dimension of the spectrum over the rationals is infinite as a vector space. So these are, that's the main theorem, both of which show the uh, additive structure of the spectrum of a metric graph is very different to the additive structure of in Poisson sum, which would, which would just be one loop. Now, just to tell you, let me make an outrageous statement. Uh, we don't know anything like this for the zeros of Zeta or, or the, uh, hyperbolic manifolds, except for some uh, trivial lifts. I don't want to go into technical things. So uh, for all we know, all the, zero, all the ordinates of all the zeros of all L functions in the world are all rational numbers. <laughs> At least for all I know, let me say that. I don't know how to disprove that statement. Let me make a wild statement to you. Every ordinate of every zero of every L function in the world is rational. The only zeros we know are at the center, so the ordinate would be zero corresponding to BSD type conjectures, so those are rational. But uh, other than that, I would expect them never to be rational, but I'm saying the exact opposite. You just produce for me one guy which is irrational. So you can see that in this metric graph, so the, the fact that you might have a summation formula and you might try use that formula to, to prove uh, irrationality is, is uh, not in the cards, at least in, in anything I understand. 
So uh, this is the strength here is obviously we're not using the summation formula. In fact, we're going the other way to say something about the summation formula. In fact, if we take this and write down the summation formula for the metric graph, it's just a baby Selberg trace formula and should read that way. And it reads exactly that way. So if you have a metric graph, the summation formula takes an exact form. This was not proved by the Roth from the Tua Ziegel Roth, whose theorem we are using to prove the other theorem. <laughs> it's some uh, mathematical physicist Roth and by uh, Kartos and Smilansky and certainly Kurasov formulated in exactly the form that we need here. And the summation formula reads exactly like the Selberg trace formula is the sum over the spectrum of delta masses at the spectrum in a, for a met, any metric graph, it's Fourier transform, which say if this were Poisson sum, this would be then, uh, or anyway, it's Fourier transform like in the Selberg case, is a bunch of delta masses. Firstly, there's a delta mass at the origin with multiplicity, with weight, with coefficient the, the volume over pi, just like in the bio law plus the sum of all periodic orbits, just like in the Selberg trace formula, the lengths of the periodic orbits, L of P, uh, the lengths of the primitive guy with each P, and then the coefficients, and I want to explain those coefficients are very, very important. The length of P is by definition, when you go over periodic orbit up to cyclic equivalence, of course, if you go over periodic orbit, you just add the length. So they positive numbers. So the LPs are positive numbers. Everything is even here the way we've chosen it. So there's LP and minus LP. And when you go around the periodic orbit, you multiply, every time you go through a vertex, you multiply by the scattering matrix entry at that vertex. So the coefficients here are not positive. They are on this side, this is, but not on this side. The coefficients, uh, uh, there's a lot of cancellation in the sum. There's an exponential number of periodic orbits, yet when you sum this, something will be absolutely tempered. I think that's uh, not obvious and it's very important. And it comes from S being unitary. So the Fourier transform of delta masses at these points, mu hat x is supported on the following set. It's supported on the set of positive multiples. The L's are positive numbers, they fixed. Uh, and we're taking positive integer combinations. So this is a discrete set. So we have an amazing fact here that the Fourier transform of delta masses at points, just like in Poisson, is a sum of delta masses with coefficients at points. And these are discrete. And that's the exact definition of concordance or of crystalline measure that are of great interest in the theory of quasi-crystals. So <clears throat> we have, as a consequence of uh, this, uh, metric graph, every metric graph, the Selberg formula for it, the trace formula, gives you the following object. It gives you a crystalline measure. So let me make an exact definition of a crystalline measure. This exact definition uh, is due to Yves Meir. Uh, it's a concept that's around in harmonic analysis, I think, for some time. It certainly goes back, uh, certainly to Guinan, who was interested in these concordance questions. So a measure mu is crystalline if it's a, a measure on the real line, which is a sum of delta masses with coefficients. And the delta masses, the set where they support it, is discrete inside the real line. And that's not difficult to arrange, but the Fourier transform should be of the same form. So Poisson sum gives you that if the, the lambda would be a arithmetic progression, then the Fourier transform is a sum of arithmetic progression. If you take finite linear combinations of that, they call this Dirac combs. So the examples of crystalline measures are Dirac combs. So they are like generalizations of a Poisson sum. If I take summation F A, summation A C F hat at F of C, it will be summation, the same thing with a Fourier transform with F hat. And you might try classify such things. In any event, these crystalline measures are of great interest in uh, Crist, um, quasi crystals. And I want to emphasize again that the absolute value of mu x hat here for the ones coming from the graphs are actually tempered, um, positive, absolutely tempered. So it removes the Riemann zeta function out of this consideration, and uh, they're often called quasi crystals. So we have these examples now that come from metric graphs. And because of the main theorem, 
which gave the additive structure, we know that none of them are finite combinations of Dirac combs. In fact, they can't even contain arithmetic progressions of a bigger than a fixed number uh, and much stronger statements. So uh, they are exotic crystalline measures and that in fact uh, le leads to the solution of a number of uh, long-standing problems uh, due to Meir, Ligarius and Levolevsky, perhaps the most basic unsolved problem that they uh, raised uh, and was raised for some years was are there positive crystalline measures? So the measure on the left-hand side is positive as ours is because it's a delta masses at the spectrum of the metric graph. Are there positive crystalline measures whose Fourier trans, uh, sorry, are there positive crystalline measures which are not ar arithmetic progressions? And the answer is <laughs> they are. All of these are, every one of them. Is such a thing and uh, these are uh, very rich and exotic. Uh, since our construction, Yves Meir has explained the construction in terms of uh, cut and project, nonlinear cut and project operation which is connected very closely to those um, uh, stable polynomials that I was telling you about. And I should say that uh, Meir and uh, Cordoba and uh, Ligarius and Levolevsky have uh, given theorems which under some extra conditions will ensure that uh, a crystalline measure must be Poisson sum. So clearly ours don't satisfy those conditions, but uh, for example, if the both sides, if the, uh, the both sets are discrete, but if on both sides the minimum spacing is bounded by a fixed constant from below, then Levin or Levsky show that you have to be a direct comb. So one tries to classify these summation formulae as a harmonic analysis question, and this shows that it's extremely difficult. And they are these positive ones. And uh, the early such classifications, I have to say this because it goes back to my advisor, the early classifications uh, use the Cohen idempotent theorem in the measure algebra, and that's how Meir and Ligarius uh, prove these kind of things. Uh, those are classifications of uh, Poisson some type summation formulae where you put extra conditions and you have to be an arithmetic progression. These examples are very far from that. Uh, I would mention a beautiful lecture that you should all go read by, uh, it's the Einstein lecture given by Freeman Dyson about 10 years ago uh, to the AMS. It's called Birds and Frogs. With such a title, I'm sure you'll go read it. Uh, bird, he describes mathematicians as either birds or frogs. The birds are the ones like Herman Weil who uh, fly around and understand everything and put everything together. And the frogs are people like he describes himself as working in the ground and discovering serious things uh, by hand. Uh, and then of course the question is, what are you? While you read that, you'll try answer that question. But one of the things he speculates, since he's at that point, maybe 80 or so, quite, uh, that the way to uh, solve the Riemann hypothesis is to classify crystalline measures, by which he means one of these, uh, he call, calls them quasi-crystal. Uh, and he speculates that they will be very difficult. And of course, this shows that it will be very difficult this way because there are just too many crystalline measures and that's, uh, not the way uh, that I think uh, anybody should be going if they had the Riemann hypothesis in mind. In any event, uh, what I think is clear there is that this is very rich. And uh, let me just end with the big heavy hitter Diophantine uh, input, because this is uh, one of my favorite theorems these days and I've, it's been for many years. It's the Lang GM in its ultimate form. This is what's used to prove uh, the theorem of Karasov and myself. And let me just state it because it's uh, such a beautiful theorem and it uh, uses the Schmidt subspace theorem. So two is equal Roth Schmidt, higher dimensional Diophantine approximation, some of the deepest, maybe the deepest methods uh, that are known in Diophantine geometry. And that's the following theorem. And this is a very uniform version of it due to Everster, Schlichobai and Schmidt. And that's the following. Suppose I give you the torus and I give you a uh, algebraic subvariety and the field of definition is irrelevant here. This is also important in the application. And I give you a finitely generated subgroup of rank R in the torus and I take its division group, all points in 
the torus for which a positive non-trivial power lies in the group. Then there's a constant that depends only on the variety, and this is used in the proof, such that the, all the points that are in this division group that lie inside the variety V are already points which lie in, so there are finitely many translates of subtori. They needn't be by torsion points. So finitely many sub translates of lower the proper sub tori, T1 to T nu. They can't be found effectively in general, but their number can be bounded. That was what I was alluding to in, in the theorem. There are finitely many sub tori such that the points in the division group which lie in the variety, these tori are contained inside V, are exactly the division points intersect the union of the subtori. So what is a highly nonlinear problem of gamma bar intersect V is actually gamma bar intersect the subtori. And it's that that controls the spectra of the metric graph in this particular application. And this theorem uses the absolute subspace theorem of Schlickerby. Uh, it has to be bound small points, large points. It's uh, a very powerful uniform statement about the intersection of division groups with sub varieties of tori. And that's exactly uh, where the Diophantine input is. I think it's exactly noon. So happy birthday, Zev, and welcome to the senior class. You are the most junior member thereof.